okay. Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. Are you waiting for yourself? A question that doesn't get asked often from the human being. Usually we are waiting for phenomenology to occur outside of us. It's as if the child is conditioned with a mindset that it has things happening for it before it is doing anything for itself. So I feel regardless of how selfish the human being is, <clears throat> the child's psychology is used to the outside moving the inside. Many people argue and they say, you know, it's like, why aren't human beings making rational decisions? Why are they irrational decisions? <clears throat> there are some things in life that the more dimensions that are added to it, the less closer you get to. And there are things in life where the less dimensions there are, the more dimensions are taken away, you get closer to. The child psychology is a non-individual copy of the room. It's as if the first thing our brains are doing is trying to be the world. Then they set themselves into motion with their own classifications. What's fascinating is we are born with physical individualism into this life, but not uh, subjective individualism. We have a separate objective body than our world, yet the child psychology doesn't know how to discriminate between the world yet. It seems to be a set of processes, natural processes that are unconscious of themselves on some level. You know, this concept of, are you waiting for yourself, it's like the person waiting for food. You could imagine all your ancestors, that there came a moment where they noticed that when the food is not coming to them, they have to go after the food. And that's my point, that in this life there are so many ways of looking at it. There are so many human beings, as I'm speaking right now, who are praying or meditating all around the world. But at the end, <clears throat> you are here. That is the biggest revelation, that is the biggest realization of life, that regardless of what has happened before, regardless of what will happen in the future, you are present. You know, it's as if the cosmos is the teacher and it's like calling your name and you're like, present! <laughs> Why 
I feel the skill of life is not to be absent for the events that we're living for. If you see life as a problem, it doesn't have an answer. If you see life as an answer, it doesn't have a problem. All human beings who their attention is directed <clears throat> by other advanced communicators to the here and now, What do you find when you come to the here and now? What do you find when you witness the soul of heaven and earth move in the moment? You know... When the child is young, it can try moving an object. Let's say you're a little kid, you're trying to move a TV. It's, it's heavy for you. It's too much for you. You know, and so you have to wait for someone to come and help you move it if you're a young kid. But as you evolve, as you grow in this dimension, you find moments where you have the strength which you did not have in the past. And that's why I'm saying, are you waiting for yourself? That means you might have been a person, let's say you tried the violin. <laughs> let's say you tried the violin and it was too much for you in your youth. You're like, my arm's breaking. What is this? Why do I have to hold this so much? You know? And then you, then you see... that the moment you choose to accept where you are, power, control, and energy finds you. You see, sometimes I feel we don't, we don't see a personality to energy. We're like, eat some food and get some energy, man. Get some sleep and have some energy. We don't, we don't see a personality to energy. But it could be this playful thing that energy goes where it can evolve. That means we have this, no, think of it this way, we are <clears throat> a complex part of nature, Caring about how energy is used. Like we can say we care about energy being used. And so it's wondering if energy cares about how it's being used, you know. It's like this mindset. I mean, this is, this is a very, I can say an idea of legend. But it was the notion that certain weapons in mythology had minds of their own. For example, Thor's hammer, you know, or for example, certain swords that they would not kill the innocent. The sword wouldn't kill the innocent, you know. So there were, there were ideas <clears throat> in the minds of You know, I'm just, I'm just suggesting that sometimes you may think nature doesn't have a mind. You know, it is very easy to feel uh, the inanimate has no intelligence. It's easy to look at a mountain and see an empty mountain peak. You are waiting for yourself, but not this self that sees the problem. Albert Einstein says, 
uh, you cannot solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that created it. That means any problem you have seen in your life, that's a level of consciousness, as Senor Einstein, <laughs> as Albert Einstein says. <clears throat> you know, I'm pretty sure Albert Einstein had a moment in his childhood where he, he wanted to be a bit cooler than him. You know, he was, and he's like, my name is Alberto Einstein. <laughs> Life is an event that in certain states of it, there is control. A lot of it, I would say, maybe two-thirds of life is automated. <clears throat> you don't think about your heart. You don't think about your inner or internal body. You don't think, I mean, seldom, you know, not everybody, but certain, <clears throat> I don't know, I've, I've, most people, their dreams are automated. Their deep sleep is a complete gap. in their conscious existence, you know. And I feel the only way the person, as Lao Tzu says, you gotta let go of the life, you gotta let go of who you are to become who you are meant to, something in those lines. You got to let go of what has passed you in this life. You see, we're trying to build a civilization with the mentality, everybody has to be a winner, everybody has to be victorious, everybody has to be equal in the time. But you think nature cares about the equality of man? You think back in the day, those people running away from that saber-toothed tiger, they thought nature cared, they thought nature was love. Nature is the way we have experienced it so far. If it has been loving for you, love will seem to be the reality. If it has been chaos for you, chaos will, be, will seem to be the reality. What that that means is chaos and order are both citizens of this realm. You know, there are creatures that their natures are here to destroy, and there are creatures that their natures are here to maintain, and there's creatures here that their nature is to actually create. And so I notice the commonality between these three, let us say, urges of creaturehood, and I called it, I think it was yesterday, I created a word for it, the adventure. The adventure. The adventure is how an event is a creature. <clears throat> so think of it this way that if you're, if you're driving a manual stick shift car and it's, uh, you got to change the gears as, as the car speeds up. And in this world, as your experiential accumulation advances, it's as if the concept needs to be like, holy shit, the context changed. I got to get my shit straight. <laughs> so the concept adjusts to the new context. And that's the thing. The context is we're in a changing world. You know, the only reason I'm talking about this question, are you waiting for yourself, is because there is a feeling of incompleteness in life that ushers us towards greater evolution. That means the, the, the health of the person is all in how much they are convinced by their past self or their future self. If your past self is a better salesman, you lose. Oh, if the past wins in its conviction of your mentality, you lose. You know what that means? Because the past doesn't have unknown variables. Have you noticed? <clears throat> it may have certain moments where you were like, what happened there? But I mean, the past is past. It is accepted. It's data that has 
entered the system and and like like a rock thrown in an aquarium the rock goes slowly to the bottom of the aquarium you know so the past is experiences that have come to the edge of the containment of the psyche now what is the future though the future is the new it has always been the new revelation is another word for the new The question, are you waiting for yourself, is all about what you deserve. And there's two views. There's a view where you as the world, you're looking, the, every human being is like this, I find. Where they are wondering about their value as if from the, uh, from the, the collective self and from, from the impersonal self, let's say, and the personal self. That means these talks are kind of in between. There are certain things that I could give as many talks, but I would not say. You know, there are, they go more into the personal dimension. <clears throat> but there are certain things that are open to the impersonal. And life is a combination of both. You're never just you. <clears throat> You're also simultaneously the event in the world that is influencing you. The event of your environment. For me, I chose this picture, guys, because this girl is paddling in an unknown in unknown waters and in the middle of night she has noticed the glow she has noticed the glow of the realm that means if there was no light imagine this girl on the boat having no idea there was a creature like that underneath <clears throat> you know I had a friend named Jim his dream was to go and become one of those people who um, takes people on tours for orca whales, like in Vancouver or something. <clears throat> and, you know, this picture reminds me of that, of the majesty of the unknown presence of nature. When you see a whale jump out of the water, you're like, yo, nature's making an entrance, you know, into there. <laughs> You know how, <clears throat> excuse me guys, it, I think the concept, just the notion of you waiting for yourself is based on how quickly you want to see the unknown again. The comfort zone means familiar pattern is controllable, so stay in it. The, the, that beyond the comfort zone, you know, it doesn't even have a concept of comfort. Like, what comfort in this life? What comfort can you have in a changing world? The greatest comfort you, have, you can have is building. That means there's a level of joy in this life that if the human being wakes up and contributes to something being made, their psychology subconsciously is looking at the engine of creation, you know? <clears throat> there's moments in, in, in these talks where sometimes I just become quiet and I just close my eyes and I write the inner realms. The inner realms are an event. When you notice that this life on one side of the coin, it's like this meaningless set of atoms moving in the middle of nowhere, but on the other side of the coin, it is a movement where its significance is not necessarily in the effect. Because the moment we divide the world into cause and effect, we can have a different value on the cause and the effect. You know? That means then the game becomes, is it a... <clears throat> Uh, if it becomes a known cause and an unknown effect or an unknown cause and a known effect For us, it's hilarious when we look at <laughs> When we look at the past, we're like, we don't know. It's too far back You know, and when we look at the future, we don't know. It's too far, you know, forward So man is left no choice. If you're a temporary creature, this life will seem like a simulation How could it not? How could in a changing world identification with a certain shape not lead to transformation. Everything leads to transformation.
There's a story I remember hearing. I think it's a story my grandmother told me. It's, uh, it's in, this, in this story, there's a man, this mountain climber. This mountain climber finds himself in a weird situation where he's gone alone in the mountain and it's, it's a winter stormy time, you know. <clears throat> and what happens is he finds himself falling like one of those things that he, one of his clips like on the mountain, you know, get loose. The guy's just hanging to a rope. He looks underneath him, pitch black abyss. So imagine you're a mountain climber in a stormy cold winter night and you're hanging from a rope and there's nothing you can do. And be, when you look underneath you, it's complete darkness as if you're in outer space. You can't see underneath you. So... The story goes that a voice suddenly, the Logos or the Divine or the Creator or whatnot, some, some voice, some voice comes to this guy. The way my grandmother was saying it at the time was like, God comes to this guy and says, like, uh, the guy at, uh, seeks help or something and this, the, the help comes from, this voice comes as a help. And the voice says, let go, cut the rope. And the guy looks down and he sees it's pitch black and he's like, I don't want to die. And he says, no. And the voice says, trust, cut the rope. And the guy's like, no, I don't want to do it or whatever. It's this intense moment where the guy has asked for the logos. The logos has emerged, but the guy's not listening to the logos. Now, the guy doesn't cut the rope. The voice is, I don't know, it's in, uh, in one level, there's the argument about the logos is that the voice is always there. We don't hear it or the voice comes and goes. <clears throat> so this guy, he doesn't cut the rope and he freezes. And the next morning there's an expedition coming by and they get shocked. They get shocked. They have never seen something like this in climber history. What is it? The guy, remember, the guy, it was pitch black abyss, it was night, the guy didn't cut the rope, so he froze to death on the edge of the cliff. But the expedition came and saw two meters underneath him, like a meter underneath him, was land. Because it was at night and he was hanging from the rope, he thought it was an endless canyon underneath. But in the daylight, it was like a meter away, so if he had cut the rope, he'd hit land and he could walk out of that situation. Do you know? You see, there is, there is this notion of a sort of will to nature, but that will to nature does not get a priority for your physical expression when your free will is here. So in that story, the mountain climber had to just cut, had to just trust the moment to ha have its levels advance. But because he didn't trust the moment, he froze. Literally. So, <laughs> so it's, I mean, at the same time, it's very questionable why, why a person would alone go. You know, sometimes I think what happens to people is what they feel they deserve in their inner realm, not their outer realm. In the outer realm, it's really, it's really based on choice. What, did that, what does that mean? That means it's like there's a glass of water, there's a bunch of people in the room. If you're, if you're thinking about external survival, you know, you're trying to survive as not just an idea, but as an animal, as an object, then there is no rationality. It's, it's like there's, there's a sort of like 20 hands going to the cup of water and it's like the first hand gets it, you know? <clears throat> So what does that mean? That means when it comes to your outer realms, don't be like, you can't, uh, shamanism is for the inner realms. In the outer realms, I would say be like an engineer. That's my recommendation. Be, like, be a designer in your outer realms. In your inner realms, be, you can be whatever you like. <laughs> you know? That means like in the future, I mean, I don't have kids, but if one of my kids was, I want this, like something like, you know, unnecessary you know the kid wanted I'd be like listen close your eyes and play with the object in your inner realms you know technically if you're if you're let's say you're some kid in a third world country and you're living in an incredible condition of poverty 
What does that mean? That means when you can't own material phenomena, it doesn't mean you are not in possession of your inner realms. Your inner realms are your gift. They are like the instrument given to you before you open your eyes in this plane. <clears throat> There's this notion that human beings, it was strange, certain metaphysical circles, this conversation arose and it took me a while to, to contemplate it. It was this strange metaphysical idea uh, of like, for, okay, so I got to build up to it. There's for some philosophers, they have this saying, they say tabula rasa. Tabula rasa means a blank slate. What does that mean? That means back in the day, philosophers, if they wanted a notebook, they'd have to find a chunk of stone and carve all day like a letter on it. You know, so like writing one sentence would take them like a week or so. <laughs> so it means it's empty, then input gives it definitioning and uh, preference and whatnot. But the notion here was that the human being in, this is in a metaphysical context in esoteric circles, you know, in discussions that move beyond the sensory. <clears throat> and the idea was pretty much that the human being is born and there is something inputted before the child even is born here on a metaphysical level. That means there is something imported before the, the, the animate being uh, manifests. Now, I was thinking about this analogy. What does that mean? That means it's like if we entertain a metaphysical thing in another dimension, it's as if we're being programmed, uh, but, the, but the display of our soul, if I can say that. This is, remember, this is an esoteric, this is an esoteric idea I'm sharing. It's, it's just the notion that um, just like how you plant seeds, how the, anima how the, how the creature animates is due to a certain unique input on on a different dimensional framework. Okay, that means think as if you're a multidimensional being and another d dimensional being, some being put a box on your head. Okay, so it was that kind of notion. It was it was something in those lines. And <clears throat> what was the solution to that? I thought about that idea. That means it's it's as if there was an intrusion even before the emergence of the free will. That means you can say your DNA. Like, they don't really care about your decisions. <laughs> you know? It, it's like their, their design is there from before, I can say. So it's like a certain input before uh, we are consciously even anything's being inputted. So what is the point of this, me sharing this? The point of it is that it reminded me of um, something that would occur in Russia... I believe it was in World War II, where the soldiers would run into the battlefield and if, if they ran back, they got scared and they ran back, Russian, the Russian uh, forces would just kill, kill the betrayers and if they ran into the battlefield, they would die. And they didn't have enough guns and enough bullets. So some people got bullets, some people got guns. And I was thinking that could it be that what the human being is thinking is an import before the lifetime of their character is actually the instrument, the tools, it is their Iron Man suit. You see, it's as if, imagine Tony Stark forgot he was in the Iron Man suit and he opened his eyes. You know, of course he would, and imagine he was living in a world where nobody had realized there's people in Iron Man suits and everybody thought they were actually their Iron Man suits. You know, so how long will it take until suddenly one person realizes they're not their Iron Man students? We've had some people, for example, you read it. I was shocked when I, uh, I, I remember it was the time I Googled spirituality just to see what shows up. And there was something about so many people reporting near-death experiences, extraterrestrial incidents and I was like look at the mind of man wait just roaring to escape the normality that limits it <clears throat> you see for me I feel we are all like martial artists there's this movie everybody should see at least once in their life it's Kung Fu Hustle and in that movie of course it's a comedy an incredibly well-made film you know <laughs> kudos to the CGI, but uh, <clears throat> it was in that film, 
you see that it's like this town of normal people, but all the people in it are secretly martial art masters, but they're living very poor, low lives, you know? And when their town gets invaded or something by some sort of evil force or whatever, by some group, then what happens is all their martial arts come out. And I feel that's what's going on. Where we have been living in our, in, 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 we have been living under a mask that, look at us, these small ants on an anthill. What's the point? All anthills, uh, uh, you know, are washed away over time. You know, and so why should we be here? But that's because it's as if we, dis it was easier for us to see the small than the big. Back then, it was easier for them to see the big than the small. Back then, the person could be hopeless. The person could be like, why am I in a world that there is nothing? There is nothing. When I say there is nothing, I'm not talking about a sort of identity-based value to life. I'm talking about it as if the philosopher's soul breaking as he looks into the abyss. In this life, we are waiting for our own internal authorization. Your internal authorization will be locked until you care for the outside that has led the inside. Because we're not, the, the notion, just the idea of selfishness is, means it's not a materialistic idea. Just take that in. That we're like selfish people are, you know, ruining this world. <laughs> but what is selfishness? It is how the non-existential or the non-physical is dictating the physical. It's like a person who hasn't worked, but they, they believe they're the king of the universe. You know, the universe is going to be like, hey, give me my crown back. There was a talk I wanted to give last night, but I fell asleep. Like, I didn't even fall asleep. I just, it was just sleep. <laughs> it was like a light switch, you know? <clears throat> Do we live for the world? Do we live for ourselves? Do we live for the world where the self arises from? Do we live for the self that the stories of the world arise from? You know, I in, in 2015, I let me say it like this. I feel 2014, even up to this moment, it hasn't been constant, but 2014 to 15, those two years were the liveliest moments of my life. At the same time, the most, they were the most, it was an exciting moment of my life. The day these talks were born, 
the day I remember I it wasn't a financially uh, sunny time and I there was this I was staying in this accommodation place and there was this like free tea you know and I remember I would just get that free tea and have my phone and like these like ten dollar fake Apple headphones you know <laughs> you just find from like these markets or whatever <clears throat> and I was in Birmingham UK and I would sit and begin talking about the world I saw and what I realized that as far as long as there is effort there is conscious change when the effort stops consciousness becomes different so in this life you can say if super intelligent computers in the future open their eyes they can see us in a binary model they can be like what the human being is is effort its energy exertion through a certain form you can even say the AI could look at human beings and be like yeah they're their code just like I'm written with code the conscious AI could be like all right human beings their code is their languages it's just that human beings were we're sort of creature in the realm that writes its own code as well you see there's there were the there was the spectrum there was the you can say there was no will there was free will and then there was divine will now no will meant that there is no you there there hasn't emerged an individual container for the meanings or the images or the senses of life yet then when there's free will this is the phase we're in now we all have free will right now but our free will is an absolute like we can't just shape shift into like a totally different kind of creature. Do you see what I mean? We're we're at a level where we it, we have our free will is in 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 regards to mobility, or the free will behind your eyes in is in how your attention is the mobility. Behind your eyes, you move as attention. In front of your eyes, you move as what's in the attention. <coughs> You know, I sometimes think about it that in my youth I wanted to be a soccer player. Do you believe that? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I could see myself kicking a ball into a net my whole life. You know, a healthy life, you know. <laughs> but asthma was like, sorry, man, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> There is no secret ingredient. That's the point of this episode, dear listeners. The only motivation, the self-help industry, it, it's missed the target. Every industry on this planet attempting to share something about truth has missed the target. The only way that a human being, Mr. Within, finds in this plane of existence, if you want to really know what truth is, truth is looking in the mirror, or let me tell you what truth is. Truth is buying a candle, lighting it in a dark room, and watching it melt. That is truth. That there is mortality. That the curtains will be pulled and the performance is standing in the merit of its own attention. What did you see? What stones did you leave unturned? Because there's moments in life that, yeah, granted, you can let the human idea play with it as much as you want. You, you can prioritize that people are creatures and it's like well, all that really, all the Martin Luther Kings and Gandhis of the world have been doing. They're like, holy shit, we're tourists in manifestation. Let's make the ride a bit more pleasant. And Mr. Within is saying we shouldn't just make the ride pleasant. We should make it advance. We should have a civilization that fascinates us. Not a civilization that we can't look at any longer. Cruelty is mud in the temple. Muddy shoes walking in the temple and how dare you. You see, it's that's, there's a giant of chaos. There's like the good person and suddenly a chaotic monster arises. But then there is the chaotic 
There is the shadow which suddenly sees the dawn walking into the room. So there's giants on both sides. You know what it is? I'll tell you this hilarious story. I, I could just, I, it's, I think it's so archetypally f perfect. But imagine there's a chaotic person and a good person. The chaotic person is fighting the good person. Or let's say there's a, there's a chaotic kid and an ordered kid. The chaotic kid starts. The chaos always starts first. That's how it becomes chaos. Everything is just an action. Chaos is the first intention in the system for destruction. That means it could, you could say there could be even internal chaos. There could be a mastermind uh, making two friends fight with one another. I've seen those masterminds and I've broken them. I've not broken them, but I've, 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 I've taken their attention away. Here's the thing. Everything is attention in this life. You realize this, you will live easily. Not easily, but life will, you will notice how complexity and simplicity are rhythmic. <clears throat> that means, believe it or not, if you don't feel like a fool, you don't feel like you, you can know. Everybody is a fool in the, in, in, uh, when it comes to novelty. Tell me one person who knows what the new is. We're all fools. Oh, oh my God, I didn't know I could do this this way. You know? <laughs> I know right now that if my talks continue to the future generations, they will be seeing blind spots that I can't even fathom. And that's okay. Because I remember listening to speakers from the past and seeing blind spots. You know, it's, that's the beautiful thing. When you care about something, the spirit of the art form opens up to you. But if you don't care about something, that means on some level you don't want to see it. That means if a husband doesn't care about, uh, you know, his wife, it's as if you don't want to see her. Or the wife doesn't care about the husband, the wife doesn't want to see him. You see, that means the attention has chosen to fly to a different branch. And the moment that happens, usually, um, for example, marriages break up. But the thing is not that, it, you can, here's the thing, they ask this uh, very old couple, uh, who had been married for like, I don't know, what was it, like 50 years, something remarkable. <clears throat> and they asked them, what would happen when you guys would get in a fight? You know, it's like their grandchildren, the, you know, the daughter, uh, the granddaughter came and asked like her grandparents. And the couple said, we came from a time when something broke, we would fix it. If the relationship broke, we would fix it. You know, there wasn't that much convenience, so people had stronger characters. But there's, there's something proportionate here that the more it becomes convenient to leave, the less you care for your performance. So the person in the relationship that it's easier for them to leave, they are actually the one uh, underperforming, under-contributing. Because you got to throw fire firewood into the fire or the fire goes out that's like basic survival <laughs> you know it applies to relationships too you know <laughs> like i'm i'm known as a person who like i don't know how uh, sometimes my friends are my friends honestly you know because i i am i'm a person who suddenly my attention i'm on the branch and then suddenly i fly into the sky you know there's moments where i there's like an intense emergence of being okay with a lot of communication in the room and then there's moments where I I'll, I need to just fly out of the atmosphere and breathe a little as a, as a non uh, non dual moment and then fly back to continue the work of eons that what is evolution it is the universe tired of it being asleep it is a universe that is waking up for what choice does it have? That's the whole point of change. You know, that's the cool thing about this life. On some level, yeah, change is definitely a freaky notion because we're temporary beings and there's death, of course. You know, the candle wax melts, the biological candle wax melts, and the candle flame has its mysteries. <clears throat> For me, it's a performance. That's, that was the point. It was as if it's something preformed.
It's a movement that is not just moving for itself. It is a movement that deep down knows the world it is from. And it's all about conscious piloting. And, you know, there's, there is rhythms everywhere. You know, think about, like, your radio. How many channels are there? How many different ways is reality happening? We all know that you can put an object somewhere in front of you and you can observe it from different angles. You could look at, you could literally um, spin around the object, rotate around the object, or you could hold the object in your hand and move it in different ways. This same sort of multidimensional access to objective perception is accessible to the inner realms and the subjective realm. And the only way it happens is if the person actually cares to know what's going on before the lifetime uh, um, you know this I mean here, here's the thing we're piloting we've piloted into manifestation and we're gonna pilot out of you you know so the most important thing is to land the plane before the pilot exits the plane of existence that's the whole point I feel of the Maha Samadhi gaze that you realize this life is existence being blissfully conscious The chat section went quiet. I've either said something so wrong or so right. <laughs> There's an honor. Every person has to honor the inner experiencer and honor the outer existence. It's easy. After you do that, then you start hearing the voice of your realm. When you hear the voice of your realm, responsibility becomes divine. There's a quote that I can't tell you. Ever since this quote, I am so happy this quote existed because it saved me. This quote saved me from a suffering of the past into the service of the future. The quote was into the joy of the future. The quote was, I slept, it was by Rabindranath Tagore, this Indian polymath who Einstein went to visit. He's like, holy shit, let's go see what this guy. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> and Rabindranath Tagore, he says, let me see if I can find a picture for you guys. Let me see. Tagore Einstein. Let's see if Alberto met Tagorio. <laughs> Guys, so this is an epic picture. This is an epic picture of um, two of the most unique minds on this planet. <clears throat> Einstein looks a bit uncomfortable in the picture, but whatever. <laughs> So guys, that's Rabindranath Tagore. You see it? You see that man? The one to the right is Rabindranath Tagore. The one to the left is Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, everybody knows. But Rabindranath Tagore is, he says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. Service was joy. That's the point of the next phase of human evolution, where we have to make our service to the collective synonymous with the individual joy. Then your life will, will be great. Why? Because your species is becoming great. You know, there's some people who, I don't know, I mean, of course, human beings hold themselves in different ways. And in different moments of life, you hold yourself even in different ways, you know. <clears throat> so, I, I can't tell you in how many ways when I look at my life, ever since existing as a creature, as a human being, as a homo sapien, it, it's been like how many times there's been an effort of ex to be expressed as a person. That means it's never the same 
personality. I don't believe we have the same personality. I feel there is a nature. I feel there is something we are concluding behind our eyes that dictates how energy moves uh, through us and as us. It is, you see, on some level, it's very complex because the more you go towards metaphysics, the less physics is in the causal point. And the more you go towards physics, the less uh, metaphysics is in the causal point. So that means when you look at life as just matter, you're like, there's no mind here, it's just atoms. We're electrons hallucinating humanhood, you know, on a complex level. <laughs> You know, it's as if our personalities are, are a mirage in an atomic universe, you know. And then from another angle, if you, t if you had me metaphysics on in, the, in the causal point, it would be as if mind is moving matter. So we would feel we are an unknown space moving known particles within itself. This wallpaper picture, that feeling, just the fact that you can see this girl's hand in the water trying to touch the unknown is the remarkable thing. This is the hope of the future, this picture. I don't know who drew it, but whoever drew this, if anybody finds the artist, I, you know, please write his name in the comment section so I could uh, share his work. Because this picture is technically divine. This is a divine picture. This is a moment in life where no other moment needs to be added in comparison to it to give it a value. That's the thing. That's when you know you're, you're, you, you found a good moment in life where the moment is complete before needing anything else. You know? It's as if the, there is a, there, it's like happiness can be unconditional. I remember saying this to my... grandparents that you don't need to you don't need a reason to be happy you can actually very irrationally be happy you can moment to moment feel as if every time you blink as if you're being gifted a realm as if every moment you look at life and it means something to you that is life allowing you And our inner realms are so sensitive and our inner realms are designed to assist us as we get older and older here in this realm. The inner realms are like the backup person. It's, the inner realms are a level of being a person that is just is not conditional to the physical movement. So there's a way where we're moving as a physical person, as a physical being throughout the day. And there's moments where as we're physically moving, we're, moving, we're thinking. And that, think, that thinking, or let me say it, that thought set in motion or noticed in motion is... I'm saying that there, the mind it can move even if your body doesn't move. You can sit still and you can move as mind. But the, the precondition, the, condi the, the, the way the universe has meaning though is different. I have moved as my attention mostly, I mean I would say, here's the thing, I would hear some people, this was years ago, I would hear some people say their attention could leave their body and go anywhere. And I was like, then why are you sticking around here? <laughs> and what it was, was this idea that attention was not uh, trapped in the body. Attention was not just located as uh, our insight, as an in internal phenomenology, you know? As if right now, our psychology is a sphere which we are inside. And so these people who were trying to go out of body, it would be as if they're going outside, you know?
our inner life will heal with stillness and silence. Your outer life will heal with movement and communication. Physical movement, that's your responsibility, your inner realms. But ideological movement of the species, that's everybody's responsibility. There is a point that in any evolution of any civilization, the responsibility of the individual collectivizes. It becomes collective. What does that mean? That means as the member of the tribe actually experiences the collective value and virtue of the tribe, the individual attains a subconscious archetype of a sort of watcher of the whole system. That means it's as if, it's as if like uh, your, your, the organs in your body realizing they're the whole body and getting access to the whole body's information, you know. We have this in view that it's just like our memories are based on just uh, all the information going to the brain. And the brain seems to be this biological projector of subjective, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, considerations of the mystery of consciousness. For me, it's, it's, if we choose to see it random, then we can't con build an ordered civilization. That's the danger of materialism. The danger of just materialism. It's as, it, it's as dangerous as it, just pure immaterialism. The reason these are dangerous is because life is like a surfboard where you're on. You, or like a boat where you got to paddle in balance to the environment. There's sometimes views on victory. There's some generals which are new to the battlefield and they think victory is right away. I want, it's like, I want it now. It's as if success is an item in a store. You just pick it up and you're like, okay, I got success. <laughs> you know, I just, I just, you know, attained success <laughs> from the store with the receipt. <laughs> so you see, that, that success is weak. The weak man's success wants to be instantaneous. But the strong man's success is not just a long-term outcome image where you're just more working hard towards. It's micro battles that allow you to suddenly, after a while, look at how you've been doing in the war and then consider victory. So there is the noob's victory, which they want to get into paradise. And then there is the sort of Victory, I would say, of the master tactician that understands that there are sequences of events, that if you saw success as an outcome and an outcome as a conclusion or an event, you would see that an event made of micro-events. So I would say human beings should pay attention. How you live is creating the memory of your for your future self. How you live now is how you're going to remember yourself in the future. So for me, it's like a Tetris game, where how we live in the present moment, it's being like the Tetris pieces on how our psychology emerges in the future. This is why there's a level of uh, mindfulness which is personal, and there's a level of mindfulness which is impersonal. You're aware of how you are a person, and you're aware of how your world is also emergent beyond personality. Oh my That's good warm coffee. <laughs>
I'm just wondering about the, the responsibility of the neo-human being. Right now we're homo sapiens. I would say we are evolving into neo-sapiens. The new outlook. The new is freedom. That means if, you, if, if somebody came to me and they were like, we have an ancient elder scroll from this secret part of the pyramids and we have an essay written by a young child about how uh, the future is going to happen. Which one would you like to read? An elder scroll that's saying what the future is going to be uh, from like, <clears throat> I don't know, underneath the pyramid of some, I don't know, somewhere in Egypt or somewhere. And then, or a child who wrote an essay on the future. I, you know which one I would choose? I would choose the essay of the child over the million-year-old or whatever-year-old uh, Elder Scroll. You know why? Because the child is the new update. That means the guy who wrote the Elder Scroll would also want to re read this kid's essay. <clears throat> That's my point. That there are, we are always attempting a, so our sort of a subconsciously immortality, you know? You either let the future breathe or you let the past suffocate you. What else can you do? What really free will means is that we are observers before we are evaluations of human life. We are watching the world simultaneously even ourself in the world happen you are like a science project you've set you can uh, uh, get feedback from you know like human living is like you're conducting an experiment but you're getting its result instantaneously you know think of like the scientist you know building the hadron collider and they're like finally we can do something now you know <clears throat> you know smash particles together at a very high speed with the potential of black holes, you know. <laughs> You know, it's, it's like wanting to hear the symphony of your DNA uh, before you, your, your, you don't have ears for it anymore. You know, it's like wanting to see how far life can uh, emerge before it returns. You know, it's like a wave in the ocean. <clears throat> There's this um, very nice Zen story. This kid 
this guy back in the day. He hears that there is this liberated, enlightened sage, Zen sage. The guy back in the day, there isn't much to do, and he thinks about the notion of enlightenment being out of this world, and he's like, all right, let's go see. Let's, let's go see what this guy knows. And so he gets an address and he finds this person at the at this town, like at the edge of like some mountain or somewhere. He finds like this this uh, kind of like monastery, like temple where there's a sage in it or something. He finds some place and he sees like the Zen sage is sitting outside meditating. And the kid goes there and he sees like it's this old sage sitting and just in meditation. And the kid just sits there for a while and he's like, all right, I'm just going to wait for this guy to get up. You know, and the guy doesn't get up. What day? It's like the guy's gone into some deep meditation or whatever. And then suddenly the guy comes back into, let's say, the room. He become, his attention becomes grounded in the plane. And the kid says... Hey man, tell me about tell me what enlightenment is. I've come so far. Please, you're you're enlightened. Say something. You know the guy is silent. Then the kids like it's like this awkward moment. Then the the person's like again, like you know, uh, the per, the kid stay, pretty much the whole point of the story is the kid stays there for weeks, for such a long time. He keeps trying every day, every day, every day trying. This guy just remains silent. And sometimes he's in meditation, sometimes he's staring at the kid, but he's silent. What happens is the kid can't take it anymore. He's like, what is this? I've been here, I've asked so many times. You don't know anything or you would have said it by now. You know, and the guy leaves. The kid gets angry, he's rude, says something rude and he leaves. As the kid leaves, he's reaching the edge of town and he suddenly gets this feeling like, damn, this guy probably knows something. How's, how's, it, how's it possible for him to be this quiet? And he, he feels it was rude or something. Something happens. It's like... Um, <clears throat> Anyways, he feels he's he feels like just going back and he goes back, you know, he goes back there and he's given up. He's given up looking for anything. And he sits there. And and sorry, he goes there as he's getting to the porch to go and sit. The guy looks at him and for the first time speaks. And the guy says, "Why this ceaseless coming and going?" And the story has it the kid attains nirvana. That's, that's what I mean by, are you waiting for yourself? You know? Why the ceaseless coming and going? That means it's like if you want an outer realm expression, decisions have to be firm in the inner realms. If you want an inner realm expression, you can be very more calm. And the, the inner realms, the more playful I've been with the inner realms, the more I've actually had uh, uh, seen a sort of, uh, efficient karmic utility of them. That means um, in front of your eyes, the outer realm, we take it seriously, but the inner realms, we take it lightly, we take it playfully. You know? This is why for me, and when I say playfully, it doesn't mean dishonestly or carelessly or foolishly. It just means you have allowed yourself the moment. You have allowed yourself to be okay regardless of any condition. It is the nature of the mind. It has accepted itself before it can even be itself. So if that's just remembered, then it's all good and dandy, you know.
when you just live for yourself only, there is there is more speed. When you live for the realm, for the honor of the realm, that means imagine who you are. I don't care. It, I don't care if it's a child in a country where it's so there's so much poverty that child is starving, or if it's this rich, extremely rich, you know, um, <clears throat> um, person in in the Bahamas or whatever. It, for me, it's it's as if all human beings, you are a part of the existence of your realm. Now your intelligence is how much you can see beyond yourself and recognize that the event. The world has a story, but we are the ones to write it. So it's strange. We want to act like good people, but then we don't want to be clones. You know? We want to build a creative civilization, but we don't want to forget our archaic values. You know? <clears throat> we want to be uh, ahead of our time, but we're not willing to change our views on time. Do you see? We have boxed ourselves in with language that we chained to matter. We shackled the uh, outer realms with, with the, we shackled objects and subjects together. And we entertained the enslavement of the, dif dif of the dimensions into the world as natural. <clears throat> you know what that means is that means there's something horrific that happens in human psychology. I mean, honestly, it happens to elephant psychology, but it's, it's like you can see it also happening to human psychology. An elephant, if the, what, the way, well, sometimes in, in certain like, countries, they, this is how they kind of like uh, control an elephant. And it's not nice, but it's just what they do. And what they do is they get the elephant, they get a metal chain or a, a very heavy rope and they connect it to the leg of the elephant in a way where the elephant can't escape from this chain or this thing and they connect it to a metal beam like as a metal beam part of a construction site or something imagine so the elephant tries like crazy to get out and realizes it's futile when the elephant realizes it's futile it accepts what it is Then check this out. After the elephant's like, okay, anytime there's something connected to my leg, I can't get out. So you know what the guy does? Then the owner comes and gets uh, unties after like a, a long time has passed, unties the rope and holds it in his hand. And wherever the rope goes, the elephant goes. The elephant has been enslaved by considering that it is a slave. And then the picture was so next level. You know what the next, the, the, the next thing is? The elephant is the rope is connected to a plastic chair. A plastic, small plastic chair. But the elephant is so brainwashed, it, it doesn't want to go further. <clears throat> the same is even true for certain insects. Where you put certain mosquitoes and you put them in a jar and they keep hitting the top. After I don't know if it's mosquitoes or whatever. It's, it, it was some insect study. The insect can't jump. The insect won't jump higher than the limit it has accepted. So we know that by doing something for a long time, you become it. You accept it. So waiting for yourself is sometimes means that it's the same way you have moments in life where you're accepting things. I think it's also natural and okay to have moments where you don't accept things, but not in regards to a physical consequence of war, not violence. Violence is, is always stupid. Like Isaac Asimov has this incredible quote, the sci-fi writer and, and scientist, an incredible speaker. He says, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. Anybody who's violent, they were not intelligent enough to solve the situation without being violent. That means they were incompetent. That means this is why it's very control easy to manipulate those who are violent and animalistic. You just throw the meat and they run there. 
You know, it, it, it's as if they don't, they're not observing their realm, so they don't wonder about other potential factors or dimensional angles to the circumstance. You know, that's the issue of being an animal. You shackle yourself to what you're devouring. <clears throat> you know what that means is, that means there is this whole thing, of course, and more... of, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? In a more exotic <laughs> sense, I would say it's the same thing in human relationship psychology, or I'm just uh, trying to, <clears throat> I mean, here's the thing, it's like, in Freudian thought, the whole concept of the sexual experience was breaking of the ego in some sense. It was a sort of breaking notion. So what does that mean? That means the same way human beings have emotions where they want to build themselves up, there's also moments where the person wants to also feel the other side of the spectrum. You know, I would say we're creatures that we shouldn't define ourselves in, in a certain specific category, but we can dis uh, suggest that like the person has tastes. So you can say the taste of the psychology is like an oscillation between the known and the unknown. In the unknown, there is no, there's no categories. In the known, there is endless can categories. So what we do with knowledge or what it seems we have done with knowledge as a species is we have infinitely, uh, or we have the infinite potential to categorize everything till the end of time. You know, we, you know how many ways we can, we, we can add en endless words. We can call it like, we can have an A time, a B time, a C time, you know what I mean? Like there's, we can we can uh, add branches to branches that have we've seen already stretch out. <clears throat> it's just how are you keeping the world, and if you deserved more, what is the emergence emergence process of it? That means I think it has to do. This is the equation, you exert energy and force with its velocity you uh, in this life two points are very crucial whoever you are i find if you want to pilot if you want to consciously pilot in this plane of existence you need to have velocity you need to be conscious of the speed and you need to be conscious of the direction in life now the direction Physically, you need to be conscious, I would say, because a lot of the abstract notions of where are we going, you know, it's like the whole joke of uh, why did the chick chicken cross the road? Because it wanted to get to the other side. And people are like, ha, 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 chicken crossing the road, that's funny. But then somebody was like, wait a minute, did they mean heaven? <laughs> did they mean the chicken wanted to get to the other side? You know, like, <clears throat> then the joke gets different dimensions. I'm just saying we are raised in a singular, the outer realms are singular, the inner realms are multidimensional. And to pinpoint a multidimensional identity is impossible. What that means is the more multidimensional a system becomes, the less one dimension has authorization over the meaning of the whole system. So the more, like imagine right now, I, in, in certain talks I've said, like 2020, let's say, whatever's happening right now is Civilization 1.0. <clears throat> I've declared that, okay, I have this whole idea, and it's pretty much my life's work with this idea of Civilization 2.0. But instead of bringing that up, I just want to share the notion. Imagine we had Civilization 1.0. We had Civilization 2.0. We had civilization 3.0, and we had all the other decimal factors in between. So I'm saying that it's, it's as if we are living through prototypes of collective design. And right now, what the internet is allowing us to do is you could be a person in Japan and suddenly seeing what life in America or uh, Dubai is like. Do you know what I mean? Right now, the information wants to live through more minds. <clears throat> you know, it's like just like how human beings want to continue in the attention of existence, ideology wants to continue in the attention of the experience.
What is life but an effort which can be directed? It was easier for me to read because I didn't have to write the words. And that's the difference between just existing and living. You, you realizing the value, there's nothing more divine than playing the instrument you were given. And even if this world is an illusion, beauty sees no veils. I'm going to share with you guys a Sufi poet named Shams Tabrizi, his, his quotes. Shams Tabrizi, <coughs> he, is, um, he was Rumi's guru, pretty much. Rumi is like this other Sufi mystic poet from 800 years ago. <clears throat> but Shams Tabrizi and many people, I feel like uh, there are some groups that have a different view on, like they don't have their accurate view on Shams Tabrizi. But he is, um, he is a man whose eyes were open before they were open. I will tell you that much. There we go. In honor of the scribes that have kept our history alive. In this quote tunnel from Shams Tabrizi, I just want the listeners to wonder about how this human is looking at the world. It is never late to ask yourself, am I ready to change my life? Am I ready to change myself? However old we are, whatever we went through, it is always possible to be reborn. If each day is a copy of the last one, what a pity. Every breath is a chance to be reborn. But to be reborn into a new life, you have to die before dying. You have to die before dying. That means the idea of your limitation has to break before you can see the limit. The chemistry of mind is different from the chemistry of love. The mind is careful, suspicious. He advances little by little. He advises, be careful, protect yourself. Whereas love says, let yourself go. The mind is strong, never falls down. While love hurts itself, falls into ruins. But isn't it in ruins? that we mostly find the treasures. A, a broken heart hides so many treasures. That makes sense because, you know, you know, if a heartbreak is literally like, you know, Daenerys burning your village, you
Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, guys. So, where was I? Oh, yeah, the quote tone. All right. So, Shams Tabrizi says, the real dirt is not outside, but inside in our hearts. We can wash all stains with water. The only we can't remove is the grudge and the bad intentions sticking to our hearts. <coughs> Excuse me. Shams Tabrizi says, whatever happens in your life, no matter how troubling things might seem, do not enter the neighborhood of despair. Even when all doors remained closed, truth will open up a new path only for you. Be thankful. It is easy to be thankful when all is well. A Sufi is thankful not only for what he has been given, but also for all that he has been denied. Because the world is wise, really. Shams Tabrizi says, There are more fake guides, teachers in the world than stars. The real guide is the one who makes you see your inner beauty, not the one who wants to be admired and followed. Yeah, guys, because let me tell you, in a changing world, what is there to, to, what is there to hold on to? Even Alexander the Great, when he passed away, it was the ceremony back in the day was on a boat and his arms were open and people in town were like, yo, why was Alexander's arms open when he was passing away? You know, isn't it traditional to have his arms closed? And then uh, in Alexander's will, it was written something like, like in his instructions was like, tell the world that I came and I conquered everything, but look at this great conqueror, even I as a great conqueror am leaving empty-handed. And that's the point, when you notice there that we cannot avoid the void, then you learn to laugh in a world that you're only once in once every day. You know? Because the world has two types of impact. First, it's like a sensory impact, the light's entering your eyes. Then it is a sort of, what does that light mean? <laughs> It's like the fool looked in the mirror and was like, am I being a creature right now? <laughs> am I being on a rock in the middle of nowhere right now? Like, what is this? You know, how do we, how do we write, a, a, you know, a letter of complaint to the universal sector? You know? <laughs> Shams Tabrizi says you can be everything in life, but the important thing is to be a good person. Yeah, because it's like that's a higher quality. You know, who doesn't like higher quality living, you know? <laughs> Shams Tabrizi says it is pointless trying to know where the way leads. Think only about your first step. The rest will come. Shams Tabrizi says the past is an interpretation. The future is an illusion. The world does not move. Uh, the world does. <laughs> ah, somebody miswrote. The, the world does not move through time as it were a straight line proceeding from the past to the future. Instead, time moves through and within us in endless spirals. Eternity does not mean infinite time, but simply timelessness. If you want to experience eternal illumination, put the past and the future out of your mind and remain within the present moment. Yeah.
that's that's the point that it's like some there's a whole discrimination between are we happening to life and the meaning is arising or is life happening to us and the meaning is arising so in Shams Tabrizi's viewpoint he's like you time is passing through you rather than us being uh, the ones journeying through the space-time continuum Shams Tabrizi says love is a travel all travelers whether they want or not are changed no one can travel into love and remain the same. Wow, this next quote is epic, guys. Check this out. Sham Sabrizi says, the words we use for the Creator are a reflection of ourselves. If we think of God as fear and shame, we're scared and have something to be ashamed of. But if we see love, compassion, and kindness, it is because we possess these qualities. Shams Tabrizi says, For a new self to be born, hardship is necessary. Just as clay needs to go through intense heat to become strong, love can only perfect it in pain. I think that's very true, guys. That means we, we can have the pain get, make us uh, push us into a weak narrative of our lives, or the pain is just polishing your ability and discrimination. So technically, there's no such thing as failure, just more familiarity with how success can happen. Shams Tabrizi says, remove all the walls and curtains so you can get closer and purely, and purely, and and purely love. You can get closer to pure love, let's say. Have principles, but do not use them to exclude or to judge the others. Stay far from idols, especially from those you made from your own principles. Have a powerful faith, but do not play the powerful. <sighs> yeah, it's kind of like walking on the edge of a cliff and wondering, do you really need to? Shams Tabrizi says you can study God through everything and everyone in the universe because God is not confined in a mosque, synagogue, or church. But if you're still in need of knowing where exactly his abode is, there's only one place to look for him, in the heart of a true lover. I think that's like a polite way of Shams Tabrizi telling the person, get out of here. He's like, go search for true love, man, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <clears throat> mysticism is honestly like it, every every system has savage dimensions by the way there's no system there's no system that's just purely it can handle intense order without <clears throat> certain it's like the yin yang symbol Shams Tabrizi says no matter what people call you you're just who you are keep to this truth you must ask yourself, how is it you want to live your life? We live and we die. This is the truth that we can only face alone. No one can help us. So consider carefully what prevents you from living, from living the way you want to live your life. Shams Tabrizi says we can only learn and advance with contradictions. The faithful inside should meet the doubtful. The, doubt, <clears throat> the doubtful should meet the faithful. Humans... Human slowly advances and becomes mature when he accepts his contradictions. Wow. So, you, so the human being, so see, there's a view where you see chaos and you want to instantly change it. Then there's a view. You just, just consider the chaos. Just see, all right. <clears throat> there's, there's like a, there, you know, there's a, there's a bear walking in the forest. All right. It's like, it's instead of going and killing the bear, you know, we just acknowledge that it's there. You know, we're not, go it's like people, you, you know, it's.
I don't know, it's fascinating that when you accept your weakness, there's no way you can feel weak anymore. You know what that means? Imagine, like, imagine you're a person, okay, you say something wrong. And suddenly, everybody comes and says, why did you say that? Why did you say something wrong? And imagine that person being, let's say person A says something wrong, and then a, a person, all the letters of the alphabet come up to person A, and they're like, why did you say that, you know? <clears throat> person A would be like, uh, they would say, why did you, sorry, not, let's, let's not even say, say that. Let's say the person made a mistake. And all the letters in the alphabet would come up to the letter A, and they're like, why? <laughs> And the letter A says, yeah, guys, I made a mistake. I know. Sorry. But I know I made a mistake. Then what else can you say to that person? What else can the letters of the alphabet say when the person has accepted what, they, what happened? Those who are content with the past get to see the future. Those who are not won't even step out of the past to see the future. So the past is very quick. Just been there, done that. Just be, uh, uh, honor your past. Just bow to your life so far and continue on. What else can you do? <laughs> Shams Tabrizi says, Be sure that someday you'll praise and thank truth for your unanswered prayers that, want you, that once you had wept for them. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's like some prayers I'm happy they didn't happen, you know? <laughs> Not, I wouldn't say prayers I would say it's like people have different it's as if the mind receives information then throws something back into the world and that's our vision of reality it's like a photon enters our eyes and a subject steps out <laughs> a subject bounces back out a subjective awareness bounces back out you know Shams Tabrizi says, don't search for heaven and hell in the future. Both are now present. Whenever we manage to love without expectations, calculations, negotiations, we're indeed in heaven. Whenever we fight, hate, we are in hell. A notion that heaven and hell are states of mind. An angry person is their own hell. A compassionate person is their own heaven. I'm not joking. Like, I'm telling you, try this out, guys. <clears throat> yeah, and if you, if you like, you can try out both ways of it. One way is, you try one day where you take nothing from the day. You just give. Anything that happens, like the movie Yes Man, but it, it's not saying yes, it's just in regards to giving. So if people talk to you, talk to them normally, but if it comes to giving any moment, any, any random event in the day that suddenly arises, it's as if the person just one day, they, 24 hours, they see what it's like to just give. Then imagine 24 hours, the person's like, not take, but just in, in the sense of just like keeping something. So the whole, I'm, I'm trying to say that when you experience different states of your own mind, you get a sense of the motorcycle you're on when you experience it at different speeds and you move it in different directions. What, what heaven and hell, they're just prototype designs for efficiency and inefficiency. An inefficient civilization and efficient civilization. I mean, it's so common sense. How else can it happen? How else can there be efficiency? Only if the inefficiency is less than the efficiency. That's the only way an advanced civilization will be built. That means I could get endless talks and 8 billion of us could all hold hands and be like, yay, advanced civilization, advanced civilization. But it, it's, it, it's not practical and real if reality doesn't change its perspective. For me, it's very hard. How do I consider reality? How do I consider what is real when it's changing? That means it's like you surfing the ocean waves. How do you classify a type of wave? 
you realize it's in some sense it's the whole ocean. What you think is the wave is your consideration of it. You think the ocean, the wave thinks it's a wave? <coughs> Shams Tabrizi says you have to live with, the, with, with people in hypocrisy for them to stay happy with you. Ah, that's old school. Let me tell you why. Because... Now, I, he, here's the thing. Because there was less an ability to add dimensions, you can say the alphabet was limited 800 years ago. Language and communication and modes of observation were limited. Human beings didn't have similar views on life because how could they, do you know? I mean, not like as, as superior as we are having views. Like right now, people can, you can say... Uh, um, uh, the genetical pattern that's continuing can express itself more than before. <clears throat> Shams Tabrizi says, be grateful. It is easy to thank after obtaining what you want. Thank before having what you want. That's the secret. I don't know like what all these law of attraction people are doing, like robots saying sentences in the mirror, even though that's, I don't know, maybe that's a strategy for you, but I'm, I'm telling you, it's about being real um, and recognizing that you, there is a temporary component to life. So you snap out of your own uh, uh, in inner realm whining upon the realm. You snap out of that. When you realize, all right, we're here for a little while, what do we do? Some observe their being. Some engage the task at hand. As if we have hands to do something, you know, to build something. Shams Tabrizi says, the world is like a mountain. Your echo depends on you. If you scream good things, the world will give it back. If you scream bad things, the world will give it back. Even if someone says badly about you, speak well about him. Change your heart to change the world. Shams Tabrizi says, intellect takes you to the door, but it, takes, but it doesn't take you into the house. A good man complains of no one. He does not look to faults. Shams Tabrizi says, when everyone is trying to be something, be nothing. Range with emptiness. The human should be like a pot, as the pot is held, is, is, is held by, by its emptiness inside. The human is held by the awareness of his nothingness. Wow. Pots, uh, like... <laughs> I mean, like, um... Dishware and... Pot cells have probably increased. <laughs> Yeah, the emptiness inside the container is what's allowing the container to be filled with meaning. Your emptiness is as divine as what's full in your life. Shams Tabrizi says, the past is a fog on our minds, the future a complete dream. <laughs> we can't neither guess the future, neither change the past. Okay, Shams, Shams Tabrizi's tripping here, you know. <laughs> No, I'm joking. That's in my time. You know, he's, he's recognized that the moment is where the show's happening. Shams Tabrizi says, being the companion of the folk of this world is far. There must be an Abraham if the far is not going to burn you. I don't know exact context of this quote. I'm going to move past it. Shams Tabrizi says, you learn by reading but understand by love. There may be one fault in a man that conceals a thousand qualities, or one excellence that conceals a thousand faults. The little indicates much. 
yeah, if you zoom in on anything, of course you find problems with it. <laughs> you know, anything you zoom in, you're, it's as if you're looking for something. When you look for something, it's kind of like in certain web um, video game companies where they develop these engines where wherever the character goes, the world gets built automatically. It's as if the based on how the input to the concept goes, the context adjusts, you know. Shams Tabrizi says, if a person claims that he really loves someone, evidence is asked from him. And that evidence is the giving away of possessions, the granting of favors. Just as when Molana claimed that he loved uh, thee when I came, he granted thee thousands of favors and protected thee, I, reg I regard these all as a grace from God. What does that mean? That means... I think what he means is it's it's like he's saying that okay so the story about Shams and uh, or Molana of course this is from 800 years ago but its level of legend was that a human being uh, was his soul was set aflame but Shams Tabrizi pretty much uh, like a kitten like a cat you know uh, grabbed Rumi from his neck and uh, uh, pulled him out of his artificial box you know and so after that uh rumi rumi was a very he was like the son of a duke he was he wasn't just no one you know and <clears throat> he was uh he takes care of shams because he notices what shams's brain is perceiving about the realm to be more significant than what uh rumi's brain uh, uh, what, uh, what, how Shams is as a person. You see, there's a personal dimension to people and there's an impersonal. You know what that means? You can judge someone and suddenly see they're a master violinist and you're just crying as they're playing the violin. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shams Tabrizi says, instead of resisting to changes, surrender. Let life be with you, not against you. If you think my life will be upside down, don't worry. How do you know down is not better than upside? Shams Tabrizi says, if you look around, you can find a face of God in each thing. Because he is not hidden in a church, in a mosque or a synagogue, but everywhere. As there is no one who lives after seeing him, there is also no one dying after seeing him. Who finds him stays forever with him. Of course, guys, the Sufi path got infused with the... Uh, um, um, it, it, here's the thing, just like in Christianity, we have the spiritual denomination, you can say more metaphysically oriented denomination of Christianity, Gnosticism. Similarly for Islam in the East, um, during the 6th century, it, there was like events, phases like after that, it was like the Sufism arose. Sufism was the mystical dimension of Islam, similar to Gnosticism is the mystical dimension of Christianity. And in these monotheistic traditions, I don't know how many people know this, but in, in monotheistic tradition, the person's uh, notion of what is occurring to the individual selfhood is that the individual selfhood is in a world, of, is in the mind of the creator. Then it's as if, uh, as if like a thought, the thought ends and suddenly it's rethought. There's a sort of after the physical life is complete through rev revelatory texts, it has been suggested that it's as if the person, after they die, they resurrect one more time, but then there's a sort of judgment event. You see? So it's, it's like that means technically both the Buddhist and the monotheist, you know, um, they believe in resurrection, but they believe in resurrection. The monotheist believes in it once happening after the being dies. The Buddhist is like, yo, bro, after you, it's like the system repeats, you know. The Buddhist is, B Buddhism is like a loop of monotheism. It's like monotheism on loop. It's like monotheism in its ad infinitum. It's literally a dolphin jumping up and uh, uh, it, it, like, you know, out of water, in and out of water. <laughs> that's, that's what I feel the transmigrating soul reincarnating is like, you know, until it realizes, all right, it's like, why am I jumping, you know? And then the mind actually takes itself seriously. And then the yo in the yoga context, they say 
that your divine memory finds you. It's as if it, when you don't chase the butterfly and you just live simply and honestly, you might be surprised how much of a workable, efficient algorithm that is. Because in life, the more in any situation you are that you don't have control, first of all, you, first of all, you shouldn't have an obsession for control, but I'm saying like, the, if you don't, it doesn't mean you shouldn't control the situation either. You know what that means? That means it's not good to control people, but it's good to control a vehicle when you're driving it at a fast speed in a highway. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> so it's not that the idea of control is bad, you know? <clears throat> it's just that what, it, what the outcome is, is suggesting the morality of it. That means we don't know if something is good or bad unless we try it and see it. Have you noticed that? For me, I was afraid of heights when I was younger, but then, I don't know, it was weird. After some point, it wasn't. It was like, just like cartoons, when the child is as young as watching cartoons, then you're the, pers the mind of the child evolves to film, and the suddenly films are more exciting than animation. Real life is becoming more and, ex more, and more exciting for the child. <clears throat> And that's the thing, your real life is becoming more exciting to you because you're actually looking at how it's happening. And that's where the declaration of control comes. Because it's like this, I, I'm holding a cup in the air right now. I have control, guys. I have full control of holding this cup of coffee in, in my hand right now. Now, if I hold it in a long enough time, time span, my hand's going to get tired. So my control is limited. So did I ever have control over the cup or not? You see what I mean? That's the thing about control. This is why dictators have in some sense a sort of um, uh, their inner child hasn't understood it's okay for the world to happen outside of their, beyond their control. Their inner child hasn't understood that. And you, you know usually how it happens? It's pretty much this. The younger the child is and the younger, at that younger age, it gets pushed by uh, uh, outside of its domain of its free will, the more it's going to want to push the world. It's basic human urge. You get pushed, you want to push back. So now, what this karma is like how the world is pushing you around. So the person, uh, that's the tricky thing that it's like as you go through intensity, you feel also you got to retaliate with intensity. But actually, keeping things simple is the source of control, I would say. That's how the greatest control arises. Where you can notice, where you can notice how something got to where it was. That's when you appreciate. So that means success is just a feat of memory. You have a good memory, you'll feel successful every day. Because you're comparing yourself to a sort of spectrum of, yo, I changed consciously to this degree. But on some level, we also need to have the mystical audacity to stare at an unknown world and realize, all right, we're sandwiched by the unknown. We go to the depths of the inner realm, it's unknown. We go to the depths of the outer realm, it's unknown. And that's why the knowledge feels like it's just like a dream where we've uh, 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 opened our eyes in the middle. <clears throat> And that's the end of the code tunnel, folks. Here's the, I'll send you, I'll share with you guys the link so people can um, check out these quotes. <laughs> Literally, the website's like inspiring quotes, you know. So anyways, um, everybody's waiting for themselves. Even if they think of a savior, the savior is still a, re a reflection of your experiences in the past, really. You know, that means what people mean to us is how we have journeyed through meaning, not necessarily how they have journeyed through meaning. You have to realize you are your own commander. You must serve the self. 
but not the self that conditionally uh, is positioned, but the unconditional awareness, which is your presence. That's, I'm telling you, the moment a person realizes this, you can say it's like style emerges when you notice yourself, your real self. And what your real self is, is how it's like you forget about history, every idea you've ever known, and you're like, okay, what is my natural uh, response if I was to reinvent the wheel? Like, who would I be if I tried to build the light bulb like Edison? That kind of wonder where you're trying to think, uh, you're considering, like, uh, attempting from your inner realms. So many people, here's the thing, I'll be honest. Like, there was a time in middle school where I was that kid who I'm like, I was trying, I wanted to go into business. So I had this mentality, I'm like, if somebody else has the answer, I just have to negotiate with them and I'll have the answer, you know? In my youth, I was like, I was okay to copying. But then, I realized I wasn't being me. I was possessed by my lack of effort. And that was this game changer. When I realized, holy shit, you can't always go and It's such a waste of time you know, to go and look for someone else to do something when you can do it yourself. If you know how to do something properly yourself, you don't need to get someone else to do it. So it's similar where in life, your intelligence, because it's so low, because we're born alone and kind of like transition alone, as Buddha and everybody, is, everybody says, that's the thing. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Um, it's, it's a time where we're moving from language worship, which has been going on ever since idol worship stopped. After worshiping objects, we started worshiping subjects pretty much. Now we've built a civilization where the individual subject is like the most important thing and we've established freedom for the individual subject, but hilariously the subject is not even physical. It's a, it's a point of, you can say it's an emergence of the conscious activity. So there's different ways that we can access world peace um, in, in, as a potential. And I'm saying the, the best solution this world, more than it needs the idea of good people or bad people or problem solvers or whatnot. It's, it's, it's like this world needs uh, input. And you are, if you can give your natural input, the world will honor your service. Nature will notice it. Nature. That means you'll, you'll it's kind of like as if right now, I think everybody is an actor, but they don't know that there's a director behind the scenes. They don't know they are, there's a director that's kind of like uh, poetically their own eyes uh, before their eyes. And so there's a director. And the moment they realize the director, that's when from this Vedic mo mode of thought where life is a game, you start seeing behind the scenes. You start noticing the camera guy. You start noticing the gaffer, the, the ones who, the light, you know, technicians. Then you notice the director shouting at you. Then you're like, ah, now I see what intuition is. <laughs> You know, it's like the director that's not listening to the, that's not hearing the sound of the, sorry, it's like the actor on set that's not listening to the director, and, but it's somehow, it's like the director's voice is not reaching the actor, and the actor's like, so I feel something in my intuition. What is my intuition telling me? Then the actor looks at the director, and the director's like, play your part, you know, camera's recording. That's the thing. The conscious waking state is when uh, the way life is being directed, it's action. It starts. The day starts. That means if you're an actor listening to this, I have a certain range of experience uh, in film, but I would tell you as an actor, uh, your, your practice, your life is your, is your practice ground, if I can say that. So that's the thing. It, we are in a system where we think we suddenly have to get rid of ourselves being individual because the individual is, is wrong, collective is truth, or we suddenly think the collective is wrong and the individual is the truth, and we're constantly jumping from these extremes like frogs. 
What is this frog-like evolution? <laughs> For me, one thing, if, if, if I was, I feel if I was born 200 years later, I would probably be doing this, where I would be trying to consider um, if technology, advanced technology was connected to animals and they could have personalities, how would we classify their personalities? That means imagine we opened our eyes and it wasn't just the evolutionary descendants of uh, the chimpanzee and an unknown descendant, you know? Um, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, uh, um, so, so what I'm saying is like, imagine there were people who they, they were like humanoid lion faces. Like they had giant heads and their faces were like lions. You know, and some people, their faces were like birds or something. Ima I'm just saying, imagine it wasn't just the chimp that got lucky in, 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 in an intelligent sleep, you know? That would be a fascinating civilization and so many ways where there would be psychology and characteristics considered in it. And I've, I've tried to share certain uh, views and all the stuff I'm telling you now, it's in my science fiction novel. There, in, in, uh, there's a chapter where there's a character, there's this blind woman, this very beautiful blind woman, a uh, blonde woman, and she's blind though, but she is so conscious, she sees more, she sees, she's like one of the biggest seers in the whole book, she sees everything. She's blind, but it's as if she doesn't need her eyes to see. She sees everything. And and she is in, in the, the chapter begins with her in the galactic sector of the United Nations in the future as one of the people sitting in the council, in the chamber. She's a very high position in, in the galactic sector of the UN. And she's also the girlfriend of the main character. <laughs> I had written this scene where it's different animals walking on the stage and in the this, in this specific scene it was a cow, like a cow standing on two legs with advanced AI technology connected to it that allows the cow's emotions to amplify on a human level of personality. And so the cow with it's, it, the cow goes there with a scarf, I thought it's only one scarf as if he's respecting the human etiquette is a cow goes there and says human beings have been eating us for eons and that is unacceptable and now as cows that we have become conscious there has to be compensation you know and I thought that's in intensive animals in the future are like hey you know can you imagine if foxes become conscious and they go to the creators of the Star Fox game or whatever and they're like hey I need to get something from this <laughs> That means I, I just saw the evolution. You see, we are, it's not possible. Animals, of course, they are of inferior species, of inferior intelligence now. Not inferior, less capable intelligence. Because there's one view where the energy is unlimited, but the form is limited. And there's one view where the form is unlimited, the energy is limited. That's like what true nothingness means, this latter. So I'm just saying this, guys. Go look in the mirror. And I want you to put your hand, put your palm on the mirror, okay? Everybody who's listening to this, who's a fan of the, these talks, please do this. Go to the mirror and put your palm on the mirror and realize that you have to high-five yourself. You have to honor the man in the mirror because that's the greatest honor. That means you, you being great as an individual is the greatest thing you could do for your civilization, but not a greatness that is blind to how the world needs to breathe for the future generations, how the air needs to be for the future generations. Like I was watching that uh, very strong-willed girl, what was her name, Greta, in the United Nations crying and shouting about like the world needs to change. You know, there's some, uh, like as a speech, she was giving the speech on environmental awareness and sensitivity, and she was crying, and I was like, sweetheart, you don't realize 
it's a design issue. It's a logistics. It's a it's a it's a actual sitting down and thinking. All right, what do we do with all this stuff on the surface of the earth? It's it's a complexity of that level where we need to evoke some sort of school of Athens 2.0 global dialogue, where we are trying to just find as a species where hunter gathers in our inner realms and we're trying to find the greatest ideas around the world to build a civilization with. So right now we gotta create an information whirlpool. And in this information whirlpool, the greatest ideas can come into. I remember sharing this idea. This was my epic vision of School of Athens 2.0. Uh, in some sense, that it's as if like there's this sort of imagine back in the day there was the call. It was my view of infusing the Colosseum with the educational system, or with the School of Athens. I would say School of Athens infused with the Colosseum. I could see that instead of us watching people kill each other with swords, we could have the whole world watch the greatest ideas around the world in a sort of even, I saw it even to a complexity where I don't know how far I'm going to go with it now, but for now I envisioned a hall of advanced communicators, literally like how you see the parliament, the EU parliament or the UK Parliament or the Canadian Parliament, you see, you see like this sort of diplomacy, this next level epic diplomacy, right? Where it's as if there is a speaker of the house, which is the neutral view, as if the Buddha is the speaker of the house. And then you have the materialistic angles and schools of thought and the immaterialistic. So I could see the same thing instead of being with like uh, the, the uh, one side, the two sides of the Parliament being unknown studies and known studies. That means the known, uh, when people looking at it from the unknown first and people looking at it from the known first. And I was saying that's all we need because the value of the human being is the complexity it can lead to. If you can honor your world, that means you saw it. If you're not, if you don't care about this world, that means you haven't seen the real world yet. You haven't seen the value of this four billion year old science project that's left here. And people are like, I just want to, you know, YOLO, I just want to go do what I want to do. And then why were your ancestors alive? You know? So that's the thing. There has to be a sort of effort of towards advancement that means whoever you are in your life this is mr within's honest opinion i don't care what your personality is if you see something better if you consciously can discriminate an efficient option and in that efficient option also your inner realms is in sync then it is it's like here's the thing there is a shyness of the mind to be a body even though we're all like, yeah, we're just bodies, but you know how many people are shy in their outer realms? You know how many wings have not opened properly yet? How many advanced communicators who are waiting for their own eyes to lift them up? So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, the only person that can truly get you off the chair of the past is the man in the mirror who sees the future. There is no such thing as normal. Back in the day, top hats, wearing top hats is normal. Now somebody wears a top hat, you just like look at them and you know, shake your head slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's like a rock star on stage, that's a different context. That's like, that's like adding class to chaos, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but I'm saying it. It's it's like it's now. It's not normal. What was normal back then? So there's nothing normal about a changing world, guys. People should just relax and try to find what an efficient collective win-win situation is. Win-win means your individual life's efforts have also contributed simultaneously to the. Uh, outer life because we don't have a really efficient we are civilization 1.0 is at a fax machine level I would say it's like it, it's it, all our advancements is is there there is a sort of 
here's the thing. This would be an ideal view of how a civil, human beings could live in an advanced civilization where the ci members of the civilization can notice the civilization and the civilization notice its members. What does that mean? This is the, even the evolution of gyms. Gyms where people go and work out. The people have to care for the space. Now, if the person doesn't care for the space, the, the gym has no choice. It has to come and clean whatever. So the uh, society gives you a freedom to do anything, but at the same time, if you were conscious of where civilization wants to go, then the citizen no longer fights the giant. They're, they're, uh, they're on the... Uh, which... The shoulder on the giant, they're on. You know, like, I, I just want to share this picture that there has to be an efficient movement forth for both par parties and uh, at the table that means like human beings have to people have to uh, go and actually care for their civilization and build it and also the civilization should care for advancing the people because the healthiest state would be all our personal needs, all our basic personal survival is taken care of by the civilization so we have time to take care of the civilization do you see? Right? Imagine where your work was collective. It wasn't just some sort of individual labor. And imagine there was this sort of system where the civilization was like all the costs of human living for to be a person on this planet comfortably would be solved. Imagine somehow in a monetary shift that, that was possible. Then people would be like, if I don't have to waste my time just to maintain my individual life, I have an attention where I can contribute to the collective life. It's only because we've started as individuals that individuality seems important. But it's, they become codependent ideas where the, it's like at the end, what do you do with the yin-yang symbol? You just realize it's one circle. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the Discord server for further philosophical discussion. Blessings. And are you waiting for yourself? Or have you realized, who are you waiting for? The most powerful, one of the most powerful sentences, there was this game called Skyrim, where the character in this game had something which was a dragon shout. The character could shout and like some special ability would happen. And the sentence, who are you waiting for, is like a shout. It's like a divine shout at the person. It's a divine roar. Really, because who are you waiting for when you are the author of your free will? Enjoy the pen while it's in your hand. It's the, it's the privilege of living. It's the privilege to walk with existence. You know, I, there's certain moments in my life where I'll tell you, if it was a sort of uh, a moment where uh, everything was stripped away from the individual life, I would probably look at the earth and be like, I don't forget who I came here to see. That means a part of my psyche it doesn't have a human uh, notion of itself. It's just it has come to be present with the world. That's the thing. That's the greatest service. That you don't stare at the shadow when if you turn the light of an advanced civilization stands in front of a civilization that you you feel honorable a civilization that if there was an extraterrestrial invasion we'd we defend right now if there was an extraterrestrial invasion we'd be like ah oh, human beings are are doing so bad to the, so much bad to the environment and other species maybe we deserve this you know what i mean like it's like we have to rekindle the honor of humanhood the honor of the mind that has noticed the celestial because there will come a time where I feel right now it's not popular, but it will be. I was thinking, I don't have children, but there was a time I was thinking, 
if I have like a son and a, a daughter and a son, I would name the daughter Andromeda, which is our neighboring galaxy, and the son Raha. Both of them different meanings. Raha means free. Raha means free. Andromeda is our neighboring galaxy. And there was something about just a person's name that is constantly attracting them to an image. Like even in, in Cherokee tribes, their names were like Storm Crow or, or like, you know, Black Raven or something, you know. They, they, that means they were, there were images. It's like, it's like a crown you put on the mind of a non-dual ever-presence, you know. Point of it. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. And um, if your life can become like this girl, where every day you wake up and you're fascinated with what, how the, what the unknown will reveal, and you just keep paddling on, it is true in Zen. Shunryu Suzuki says life is like we we build a boat and we paddle into the middle of the ocean and then suddenly the boat sinks. Like suddenly we're building up, building up, building up, then the stimulation ends, right? But there's something about while you're living, uh, while you're existing, that you appreciate the the style of how your experience moves in front of yourself. The unknown is the greatest source of wonder. It is where knowledge, like a phoenix, rises from the ashes. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Blessings. I'll see you on Discord.